So um, just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's registered for Daniel's seminar this evening. Um, we've been doing these seminars uh, for quite a few months now, and we had a little break over the summer. So this is our first time back. So we're very grateful that to you, Daniel, to, for giving, giving up uh, some time this evening to speak to our community. Um, as I say, um, we've had a short break, so we're quite keen to get back to our seminars. Just a bit of housekeeping for everybody attending. Everybody's uh, video cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout the seminar. Please respect this throughout the seminar because it's very distracting if you're trying to speak and microphones are pinging on and uh, video cameras are pinging on. So if anybody inadvertently switches something on, there are moderators in the background who will switch them off again. So uh, thanks for understanding about that. The seminar is being recorded and all attendees will either receive a recording after the event or um, a blog piece containing what we've covered in this seminar. Um, so you don't, need to, you don't need to take a load of notes uh, one way or the other, you'll get an overview of what Daniel's going to speak to us about this evening. So uh, big welcome, Daniel. Thanks very much. I'd just like to read your little bio out so everybody um, knows all about you. And I will, I will read that because I haven't memorised that off by heart. <laughs> so Daniel uh, completed his BA in psychology and MSc in mental health counselling in New York. Both these degrees have given him an in-depth knowledge of the brain's neuroplasticity, processes, functions, chemical makeup, as well as uh, behaviours and knowledge of various therapeutic techniques that he uses to break down and deliver according to each individual's needs. He's, in his words, he is experienced, confidential, empathetic and engaging. Since qualifying, he has worked in a residential setting with patients experience mental health issues in New York, teens at risk in London, being a clinical director and director of a counselling service in London, co-authored two papers published in scientific journals and have a private practice to help support individuals, couples and people with mental health issues. For the last nine years, he has been supporting people with chronic illnesses mainly considered hidden, such as Lyme, chronic fatigue syndrome, and sensitivities. Daniel has worked in three countries and has a success, successful sorry, international practice conducting online video consultations across Europe, America, and the Middle East. So that's you know, quite a bio. Thanks very much. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Um, good evening. I would like to thank Julia and the team uh, of Lyme Disease UK for having me speak. And I would also like to welcome anyone listening. Lyme disease is a medical condition. It's not in your heads as so many people are told. However, a person can be affected by psychological conditions because of the illness. Although the psychological effects of Lyme disease vary from person to person. I have chosen 10 main areas I have experience working with internationally over the last nine years in clinic, using various techniques that are mine or taken from different modalities and times, conversations and personalized plans. I hope it will resonate with some of the listeners. Each point may be short, but actually is hours of hard therapy work. It's teamwork and individualized plans to suit everybody's needs. So let's start with number one, hopelessness and helplessness. This can come from a variety of places, but I will focus on one. The fact that many people with Lyme disease are not believed and are told their symptoms are in their heads. They go from professional to professional for years being told this, when the person knows that they are ill and getting worse. Psychologically, this makes them feel alone, abandoned, let down, have lack of trust in healthcare workers, depressed, anxious, and with no light at the end of the tunnel, and nobody listening to them. Number two is fatigue. Fatigue can leave 
individuals housebound, bedbound, and unable to have any type of routine, and it can hit at any time. Fatigue, although physical, has also got a psychological impact, such as depression, anxiety and fear, helplessness, and a reality of missing out on friends, family gatherings, events, social gatherings, work and birthdays. Basically, life, which is heartbreaking for them. Number three, excuse me. Number three, stress and anxiety. Stress and anxiety plays a large role in Lyme disease relapse and as well as not improving. Stress and anxiety come in all different ways, whether it's illness related, environment, family or financial. It's impossible to eliminate stress and anxiety, but we can learn ways to decrease it. We can learn ways to combat it and to handle it better. Number four is time frames. I will often hear this protocol ends in three months and I'll be better by then. Or I may hear I'll be back at work by January or this will all be over in five months. Although we wish this to be true, this is not how illness works. And sometimes it does not fit into our schedule. When, well, I, see, okay. when I see people reach the end of those time frames without being better, I see hopelessness, depression, worries for the future with questions like, will I ever get better? It's better not to have time frames. Number five is comparisons. As humans, we look to others and make comparisons. When it comes to Lyme disease, patients will look to see who got better and how quickly and fall into a negative mindset asking, why am I not getting better? I need to change my protocol. Defeating thoughts, questioning themselves, including their treatment. Comparisons are always going to harm you and they're never going to be fair. We're all different, different strengths, different bodies, different environments, different finances. How can we compare ourselves to others and make a fair judgment? We can't, so don't do it. Number six, remember yourself. So many people begin to define themselves as having Lyme disease. Lyme disease dictates their thoughts and actions. Of course, one has to look after oneself and do all they can, but remember you are still you. You have goals, needs, wants, and wishes that have nothing to do with Lyme disease. You may need to plan things differently, but you can still lead your life. Number seven, losing friends and family. Many people tell me that they've lost friends and family. They're simply not there for them in their time of need and vanish. They cry and are torn apart by the loss and feelings of abandonment. But are they really losing someone? Or have they found out who their true friends are, who are not worth investing valuable time, mental energy, and physical energy into? Better they have shown their true colors, and you are now with, left with genuine friends or looking for genuine friends. It's not numbers, it's quality. Number eight, although we all worry about our future and what will be, children and teens have very strong anxieties about the future. This is because they feel a loss of their education, daily school routine, friends, social life, and all the dreams that they've ever had or been told they can have feel lost, which is psychologically devastating and very difficult to grasp. Their entire world has been taken away. But Lyme disease does not have to mean loss. Lyme disease cannot change dreams or goals. What it does mean is we adapt, but we still move forward. Excuse me. Number nine is apologizing. So many people with Lyme disease apologize to friends or family constantly. Sorry I couldn't come. Sorry I had to cancel. Sorry I couldn't be there for you. My answer is stop apologizing. You have not chosen to be ill. You cannot, if you cannot do something, say, without feeling bad. What is more important, your health or going out and having to pay the physical effects? Number 10, 
space to speak to the correct person. Clearly, this is medical. There are obviously psychological fallouts. We are social beings. We have to speak to organize our thoughts, to better ourselves, and to unburden ourselves. Lyme disease is complicated and affects people in so many ways, physically, psychologically, socially, environmentally. Speaking is a way to help oneself. In conclusion, although someone may not have all of these areas affect them, with each area, I build a personalized plan through education, various techniques, understanding, conversation, to support you through the achievable goals that we've created together, step by step. Thank you for listening to me. Julia? Okay, I'm back. <laughs> and I'm still here. Hello. Hi, thank you really very much for that. Um, I know there are other people listening who can probably say the same, but I think I've experienced every single one of those points. And um, it would have been so much easier, that journey, if maybe somebody could have pointed those out to me, particularly the things you've mentioned, like um, hope is helpless, um, apologising. You know, they're, they're so literal, aren't they? So um, I'm sure everybody will resonate just like I just did listening to you. So we've got, um, we've got a list of questions that we can discuss as yeah. fully as, as you want. Um, and for everybody attending, there is a chat box at the bottom of your screen. If anybody wants to pop a type a question in there, if we've got time, then we can pick a couple out. Um, so we'll go ahead with the questions. A couple of people have sent questions this evening. They've just sent an, an extra question this evening. Uh, but just to let them know if they are watching that they're sort of covered in some other questions we've got. So which we've put, we'll put a bit more generally. But to, to sort of kick off the questions, um, can you give us a bit more information about your, your online consultation service and is it available for UK patients to access? Yes, so absolutely. So my first session that I do is an assessment. It's, it's non-diagnostic, but, but it's an assessment. Uh, it lasts around an hour and a half. Um, I have a series of questions um, about the person, about their diagnosis, its effects, their medication, their family, life events, environment, friends, traumas, and, and a general timeline uh, of the person's life. Um, obviously, there are some, some deeper and more personal questions, uh, attempts at suicide, uh, thoughts of suicide. Um, I will also include information about myself, so what I do, so some of the techniques that I do that are cognitive, and uses the brain's uh, neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to learn and uh, reorganize and, and adapt. I will explain some of the behavioral work which I do, which include uh, tasks and homeworks. Um, there's a few relaxation techniques depending on the person and, and the situation, and a number of other techniques. Um, it's all gonna be teamwork, it's all cooperation, it's all uh, um, very much teamwork, which I've just said. Uh, Follow-ups are around one session a week, which is which is one hour. That also depends on the individual. Some people like to have two hours, some people want an hour and a half, some people split it up. Um, some people do less. Uh, if they have uh, fatigue, there will be less than an hour. And, and of course I'll be accommodating. Um, my practice is, 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 is global. You know, whoever wants um, a session, I'm more than happy to, to accommodate. Um, you can get in touch with me via my email, which will be on the, uh, website um, of yourselves and my website I believe will also be there um, but my email my email is mentalhealthcare one word at hotmail.co.uk um, yes and, and I'm happy to see anybody who who gets in contact that's really kind of you Daniel really kind and we will be adding either the recording of this seminar or an overview of it with your details on the Lyme disease UK website um, and I'll send you a link to that when it's all done so question number two yes what would you say has been your most powerful light bulb moment or moments with clients with chronic illness what's really sort of you know when you've thought uh-huh okay so um my light bulb moments or my realizations have come along 
as my experience and has grown and the more people I've seen and, and I've worked out and honed in on my skill set on what works for people. And there are a few things that pop up in my head. Uh, number one would be to um, educate the person um, and teach them what they're feeling, what the emotions are. So when somebody says they're anxious, what does it actually mean? Right? What does it mean in chemical format? What does it mean for them as a human being? Why are they having it? All the reasoning behind it. When somebody has that education that's not simply off a, a Google internet uh, web page, and they can ask questions and they understand what's going on with them emotional, uh, in some instances physically, if it's connected to Lyme disease or chronic fatigue, um, it helps uh, relax them a little bit in that there's more understanding. So one aspect of what I do is educating the person to, to the best of my ability. The second thing that I do is actually explaining what I do. So every technique, I explain where it started, who started it, the year it started, why it started, why I use it on them, and why it's good. Um, and again, with that knowledge, it helps the person not only understand, but it, it's easier for them to go along with what's being uh, explained to them and told, and easy for them to uh, use whatever techniques and knowledge come their way. And I think the last thing that I really like to uh, implement is that I'm not better than the other person I'm speaking to. So I have an education, I have the experience, but often I found people come into a professional and they expect the other person to they kind of hold them on a pedestal. I don't want to be that person. This is going to be teamwork. It's going to be uh, working out things together. It's going to be you calling me out on something and telling me where I've gone wrong or what I've said wrong or anything along those lines. So I found that those three elements tend to um, help the process of, of therapy. I think I think that's, you know, that sounds really positive because it, it isn't one person who's, you know, more knowledgeable or uh, how's it, you know, because we're used to, um, especially, you know, going back my generation and older, um, used to put anybody, doctors, psychologists, you name it on a pedestal, but that that shouldn't be, should it? It should be a partnership, as you've said. So that's really, really positive. Um, so we've all got family and friends. Um, sadly, when people are chronically ill, sometimes that circle gets smaller. Um, but the family and friends who stand by people, how do you think they can best um, support their loved one's mental health? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, the first thing I would say is listen. Sometimes there are things that are said that we need to catch on to. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily fix anything, but it does mean listen, have a listening ear, be there and be ready for when somebody says something that's possibly crucial to them and their welfare. That's number one. I would also say educate yourself. Education is always important when it comes to therapy because knowledge is, is important. Again, it's not about doing a random Google search or something because I don't think we always get the answers that we're looking for anything necessarily useful. But to educate yourself on what your family member or friend is going through so you can understand how they may react to situations, how they may react to you, how you may by accident trigger them off on something. So education is, again, very important. If they're close to you, I think number three would be watch for changes. So when there is a mental health issue, changes do happen. For instance, if somebody then uh, locks themselves in their room for long hours, is that a sign of depression? Is that a sign of hopelessness or helplessness? So I would say look for changes that aren't within the norm of what you see with that person. And the last thing I would say is, is know at which point you can't help and direct them. So don't just keep on listening because if you're hearing things and they need the extra support or they need somebody else, then direct them. And, and that's a, there's a very kind of fine line between that. So I would say for me, that those would be the important points of how you support a, a loved one with, with a mental health issue. There obviously may be others. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so important, you know, even if we do, lose some of our circle of family and friends which is quite common and we all know that you know is you know listening 
believing, I suppose, is another one. And yeah. you know, and like you say, getting extra help if you if you see things that you you know that are, you, you know are worrying. Um, self help. What we can what we can do to help ourselves. Are there things when we all get in the self help? You know, I'm, I'm sure we all Google stuff and we look we look on different platforms and we look for self help tips. Do you think there are things we should avoid, or are there things that can make things worse? So yes, um, there are a few things that, that, that spring to mind. Um, one is stresses and anxieties. Um, obviously, we can't avoid those. Those are natural parts of life. Um, there are some that we can avoid. And then there are some that uh, we have to learn the skill set to try and decrease those stresses and anxieties. Stress and anxiety is, is, is like I said earlier, is, is going to uh, create relapses in Lyme disease. It can do. It can also stop you from improving and getting to the point of where you want to be going. So stress and anxiety is where possible to learn the skill set to try and decrease that as much as possible. With Lyme disease, I would say overdoing things. Try your best not to overdo things. Um, it's easy to say. Uh, there are techniques for that. There are things that I, I, I work around for that. But overdoing things uh, um, is, is an important fact. It's stay within the energy levels that you can do is going to be very, very important. Um, important and that goes along with trying not to do too many things. I think another thing when it comes to Lyme disease would be um, not rushing to do things. Um, most people with or a lot of people with Lyme disease have missed larger portions of their life. They've missed out on events, they've missed out on friends and then as they get stronger they tend to rush out and try and do all those things. Yeah. My, my first answer is don't do that right. If you control that rushing and do one thing at a time you will be able to get all those things done but as soon as you try to rush all those things and cram them all in you're going to feel that crash you're going to feel that dip so again there, there are techniques that I, I, I use and conversations that I use to, to work around that and the last thing that I would say and again it's not a, you know a full list um, is playing around with your protocols right I, I, I've often found not often there have been occasions that I found that as people get stronger, they will start to take away their supplements. They will take away their vitamins. They will take away schedules that they had built. They will play around with medications. Um, and that's because they're getting stronger. But my answer to that is always, that's part of why they're getting stronger. So don't take those away, carry on doing them. And then hopefully you will get even stronger. So I think those would be my, my, my things to avoid when it comes to Lyme disease. Okay. Um, things to be mindful of when seeking support from other patients who are also vulnerable. Um, patient to patient support is, you know, is very helpful in some cases. Um, but what to be careful of when, you know, with that relationship, do you think? Okay, so one thing that I mentioned earlier, which I would say be very careful of when I've seen on quite a few occasions is comparisons. So you may speak to a friend and they will be on a particular protocol and it will be working for them. And then it will be a case of, well, I'm gonna come off my, my protocol, I'm gonna try the other protocol and that's gonna work for me. Comparisons just really are, you know, they don't work and they're, they're very damaging. There are reasons why that protocol works for the other person. The other type of comparisons will be, well, they've been ill a shorter length of time and they're already getting better. Why am I not? So these kind of thought process, again, are normal, but actually very damaging. So I, I would be very careful how to use those, uh, that support system with, with another patient. So I, I, I would say, if you're going to encourage each other, that's wonderful. If you're going to support each other, that's wonderful. If you're going to compliment each other, it's wonderful. But if you fall down a route of, uh, com comparing each other that's more of a problem I think the second thing um, that I would also mention is not to rely on the uh, knowledge or health knowledge of the other patient um, 
many patients speak about the things that work for them. They speak about the knowledge that they've read from books and from their doctors, but that information doesn't always relay over to the other person. It doesn't necessarily mean something medical wise to the other person. And so I, I would say, be, you know, be a little bit careful on, on, on the knowledge that comes across. Not that it's necessarily wrong, but it just might not work for you. And therefore, seek your own doctor and seek your own practitioners. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, obviously, we have an online support group linked to our charity. And, you know, like you say, there's a fine line between supporting, encouraging, complimenting, but not saying this worked for me and you must do it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. That's a, I think that's a big one. Um, obviously, Lyme disease itself, you know, the bacteria effect of Lyme disease can give some people psychiatric symptoms. So how can we tease out which are the psychiatric symptoms caused by the infection itself um, and the other psychiatric or can be psychiatric effects of being chronically ill because they all interlink don't they in the end when you're getting anxious about what you're feeling we, you know it's really hard to tease them apart is there any easy way to tease them apart okay so I can only talk about my own uh, personal experience in, in, in the work that I do the first thing one of the first things that I'll say to the patient is that absolutely there is the medical side that's undeniable that's what's there there is also the psychological element which that's my my area of the of the work um the goal for me one of the goals for me when it comes to therapeutic work is to try to make sure that there's progress that there needs to be progress with the patient it, it doesn't matter the amounts but just that we see from the work that we're doing that there is progress in one one form or another and I will use all the techniques, I will use the conversations, we can use trial and error on some occasions, and there'll be homeworks and tasks. And I'm always very clear that once we've tried everything and we reach this kind of barrier where nothing really works anymore, I'm very clear that that's the point which is medical. So I can only reverse some symptoms to a certain point. <laughs> and that's when I've tried everything. If we hit that point, I'm very clear and say, okay, that's medical. That's where you seek your, your doctor, somebody who knows the other things that I don't necessarily know. And then we will come back to that space and keep trying to push a little bit more, but once the medical side has kicked in. And then around that, we will do the work on the other aspects. But the, but the bit where we get stuck, that's the bit where I say that's medical and you know, there's another way of doing this. And that's again, of course, where I draw the line because I, I can't, step out of the realm that I'm trained in I have to be very careful I yeah. hope that helps yeah yeah I, I really get that I mean just from personal experience because don't think it does any harm sharing personal experience is that when I became ill I, I've never had an anxious I'm, I'm not an anxious person I've always been very laid back um rarely worry about things because my attitude was well worrying isn't going to get me anywhere so why bother? I was always one of those sort of people. And then um, when the infection set in, got extreme anxiety to the point of, um, I couldn't have been more frightened if a couple of lions had been sitting in the room with me. And I couldn't work out what on earth was going on. I mean, through the work I've done over the years, and I realized that that was probably the bacteria because that's that level of anxiety to go from nothing to that wasn't, but I, I didn't know it at the time, and it was very frightening. Um, so, you know, it's, I understand how difficult it is to tease out. And um, knowing what I know now, you know, I would definitely know that that was the illness rather than me suddenly becoming hyper anxious. Um, but it's a difficult one, isn't it? Yes. You know, when, it, when the infection affects the nervous system and brain, I mean, it's, it's fine to look back when you've got the knowledge, but people get very frightened of that sort of thing so to work through it with somebody like you to work out is it you know is it a psychological anxiety or is it you know that your brain's been affected by a pathogen so yeah I think that's a really important one so next question um is about teenagers and children yes so 
Um, very chronic illness is we all know that it's really hard for it's hard for anybody, but it's really hard for teenagers who want to keep up with their peers and children missing school, falling behind. Do you have any specific advice for helping teenagers and children? Okay, so I'm going to answer this through the lens of a of a parent um, in 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 helping their their kids. Number one is listening. That's something we mentioned earlier. Um, always be around to listen to what your child has to say and really listen to it. So don't be on the run whilst they're saying something. Sit and speak with them properly, have a conversation um, and, and actually hear what they're saying because it will make a difference in what your behaviour is towards them and how you react to the situation, how they're feeling. I would also say be positive around your child. Um, and I say that because obviously this is scary for the parents. The parents are can be depressed at seeing what's going on. They can be sad. They can also feel hopeless and helpless at, at trying to do something for their child. Um, and they can have their own emotional roller coaster that goes with a diagnosis for a child. And so I would say be positive no matter what your feelings, but when you're speaking to your child, be as positive as you can. I also would add to that, also be realistic with what you're saying. Children are not stupid. Children are in the consults. They will do some of their um, own reading. So although be positive, be realistic as well, depending on what's being said. I would say encourage and support your children, um, which is obviously going to be very important that children need to feel the support of, of the person that's their role model, the, the, the biggest person in their life. And also if they become housebound, that might be the almost one of the only adults, two only adults in their life at that moment. And I think very importantly, just looking away from the teens for a second, um, I would recommend parents get support for themselves they need to understand what's happening. They need to uh, try to get their mind around uh, what situation has just occurred. Um, and they also need to work out coping mechanisms for themselves. They need to make sure that their uh, day stays fairly similar. In other words, that they don't become out of sync with their day, that they, that they keep themselves in check because if they're not, they're not gonna be any use to their child in getting them better. So I, I feel that's always a, a, a double-edged piece of work there, which is be there for your kids, but actually understand that you need someone to be, someone there to kind of look after you and, and help you out in what you're going through. So that would be my, my angle on advice for, for teens and kids. I would absolutely second uh, what you've just said, because I come from a background of um, paediatric nursing, specializing in very sick children, terminally ill children, and what you've just said is absolutely spot on that, you know, um, never forget yourself as a parent while you're supporting a child who's, who's, you know, very poorly and missing out on life, like you said before. But it's really important to support yourself as well and, you know, stay positive around your child. And you can you can do that if you get support for yourself. And I'm sure you've seen that in loads of loads of cases. It's really important. So this is a question that crops up lots and lots in our community. How, how would you advise people who are dealing with the trauma, and it is a trauma, of not being believed, um, being dismissed, or, or people, you know, how to respond to other people who have false perceptions of your illness, um, which, you know, that's it's really difficult when people just don't believe what you're saying um or or the other classic one is i you know i i've been on the internet and um there's no such thing as lyme disease um you know we get we get it don't we so how would you how would you advise people to respond to that sort of situation okay so this is actually quite a tricky one mm. um and with every person i've found uh something else works some things don't work um, you are 100% correct, this is a trauma, 
um, and it starts off often with professionals um, not believing, being told it's only psychological, being told it's only psychiatric. Um, and then that moves on to friends, family, people you bump into. So it is trauma. Obviously, there are spaces where we work out trauma and try to analyze the trauma and try to work out how it's affected you. That's always my a first port of call is, is try to work out um, what trauma it's caused you, what damage it's caused you and how you perceive it. That's first. Um, and then there are a variety of other ways that I would work with things, but I'll, I'll just kind of explain one. One is people, not all people, I'll be careful, people might not want to read up on something. They're not interested. Some of them don't care. You're going to bump into people like that. When I look at professionals, I'm talking about just kind of street people. You're going to bump into people that just simply don't care. People that are not interested in learning, people that are interested in working out what's wrong with you. They see a face value and that's what it is. You can, if you want, spend your time explaining and giving websites and educating. And sometimes that works and some people do turn a leaf. And sometimes it's just not worth the energy. It's not worth the time. It's not worth anything because you're not going to win something from that situation because they're just not going to land up understanding, caring, or want to care. So I think one, one angle out of the many that I might take is, is changing your own expectations. If you expect people to understand or want to learn or want to find out, well, you're going to be devastated. You are going to be traumatized because it's not the correct expectation. A correct expectation might be a number of people within 10 will be happy to listen to you. So I think changing expectations uh, doesn't get rid of the trauma because that's, that's, that's a big one of being believed, especially for years and years. But if you already kind of expect something to happen, it decreases the, uh, the hard hitting effect that it has on you. But, but that takes time, that takes work, that, that, takes, that takes more people telling you, I don't believe you and you turn around to, oh, I expect that to happen. And you're one of those people that just don't care. So it's, it's a little bit of a bit of between a, a guesswork of whether you want to try and tell somebody or you want to save your energy and just change your expectations. Yeah, I think that's very wise, very wise advice. Um, a lot of people um, develop insomnia with their illness. I know, again, from personal experience, I did after never having a sleepless night in my whole life. So it was a bit strange and, and, and again, scary. Um, so what would you recommend for people with insomnia, but insomnia caused by anxious thoughts when trying to fall asleep? Okay, so I would, I would quickly just cover regular kind of things that you might be able to Google on, on going to sleep without the anxiety. Don't drink caffeine, or at least reduce it during the day. Reduce device usage at night time. Your bedtime and waking time should try to be as consistent as possible. Um, make your bedroom the best environment possible to sleep in. So block out any external noises, good bedding, good temperature. You might want to relax and meditate before uh, bedtime. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend exercising before bedtime. When we talk about anxiety though in particular, um, one point that I've found works, I can't say for everybody, I don't want to overgeneralize, um, but is uh, acknowledging the anxiety. So often when people get anxiety, especially at nighttime, they try to push it aside. They try to think about something else. They try to uh, basically try not to think about it. For me, it's acknowledge it's there, right? Think, you don't have to think about it in detail, but you could just acknowledge that that's where your brain has taken you. It's taken to a place that you worried about something. And what is it in particular that you're worried about? So first acknowledge it. I think that that is less stress on your brain trying to push it out of the way and then just acknowledge and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about something. I think at some point in waking hours, I would do what I said before, which is get some kind of uh, edu uh, educational anxiety. Where does it come from? Why does it start? Why do humans have it? What chemical is at work? And so then what does it mean for you? And again, knowledge is power, as they say, if you know, uh, what anxiety is and why it's happening, then it, it, it takes a little bit of the edge off of what you're feeling. And then I think the 
third part, which I would say is important, um, and again, part of the work that I do when it comes to anxiety is, is setting out clear goals on how to resolve that anxiety. So whether it's triggers, you work out what they are, whether it's something going on in your life, you work out what they are and try to resolve the anxiety to the best of your ability. That doesn't mean it goes down to zero because we, anxiety never goes down to zero, right? There, the anxiety always kicks off at some point in life, um, but it's, it's to find the goals and the steps to resolve that anxiety. Um, and then people often ask me, well, do I wake up in the middle of the night time and quickly jot down some notes? Yes, why not? Right? If that helps you relax, that you've put out a mini plan next to you or a mini set of goals, or I'm going to do X, Y, and Z next to you, and then you can sleep better, absolutely. Why not? That's really interesting. Um, this question, it's something that I, I, I think is really interesting, um, probably from my background previous to illness, but it really fits in to chronic illness as well. And it's something uh, that I work through. So in your opinion, is the grief process, which comprises of shock and denial, pain and guilt, anger and bargaining, depression, maybe then an upward turn, reconstruction and working through acceptance and hope, is, is the grief process relevant when experiencing chronic illness? So I, d I don't know if I would name it exactly as grief process, um, but I would say this, all of those as individual emotions and not necessarily in that order, people will be affected by. So the answer is absolutely yes, but I don't know if I would give it the grief process uh, title. Um, mm -hmm. these, these are all psychological uh, emotions and, and feelings that someone will have with, with a chronic illness and, and it's part of their journey. Um, so if I were to just give a kind of a, a couple of examples, anger, absolutely, you, you're going to have anger at some professionals, right? Like I said, you, you're going to bump into people that don't believe you, even if they're professionals, um, and you're going to have anger at the, the why me, and that's where we try and get people's heads around what's happening and and, and all the reasonings behind it. So there's anger, correct. Is there depression? Of course, there's loss, right? There's, lo there's loss of loads of friends, family, physical ability, uh, being able to go out, social settings, there's lots of loss. So can you become depressed? Yes, it, it, whether it's physical, mental, environmental, but absolutely you can have uh, loss. Acceptance, yes, right? There needs to be at some point an acceptance that you are, that you're ill. There also might be um, an acceptance needed that you might not get back to 100%. So yes, there, there needs to be a, a level of uh, acceptance. Acceptance can also be that it may take longer to get back to your 100%, but there needs to be a level of, of acceptance. And if I were to pick out hope, um, yes, absolutely, that needs to be involved. We have to find hope and we use goal setting for finding hope, but there needs to be something in your future that you can look forward to. So I could pick out all of those uh, items as emotions somebody will go through the chronic illness, no particular order, and maybe not everybody will get them. But yes, as, as an emotion, absolutely, they are there, yes. And you can bounce between them all. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, some people will, will, will have hope for a long time, and then there'll be a trigger, or there'll be a setback, or there'll be a, a relapse. And then of course they will, possibly move back into a state of depression or a state of concern or a state of anxiety. But, but of course, within, like I can only talk about myself, but I hope at that point, they will have a skill set to be able to take themselves out of being in that position. So they'll have a skill set they walk away with with me that they can then use by themselves without even having me around. But yes, you, you can bounce very quickly between, between all of those emotions, yes. Is there any way of um, turning around the why me? Why me? Because I hear that constantly, not, not just in my own circle of, you know, people who are ill, but, you know, other things happen to people in life. And, you know, the first response is, why me? Um, is there any, you know, measuring beginning to say to yourself, well, why not me? I'm not, you know, it's happened to me, but it could happen to anybody. So instead of working from why me, going to, well, why not me? 
and moving on from there sort of thing. Do, do you find that sort of thing helps? Yes, I, I think that's also part of um, acceptance that yeah. things can happen in life. Uh, no one has said life is going to be easy for everybody. No. Uh, no one has said life is not going to have challenges. Everybody's going to have challenges. Everybody's going to, at some point, hopefully not, but at some point face a medical issue. Um, that is part and parcel of life. So it, it's not necessarily the, the why me, but it, it's the acceptance that this can happen in life. This does happen in life. And now not to get stuck on the why me, but the how do I progress? How do I move forward? What are my goals? What, are, what am I doing with life? regardless of any health conditions that are that are going on and that's also I think I said it earlier as, as I separate off what is illness and what is person what, that's when I said remembering me is, is remember that you've got goals and wishes and needs that's nothing to do with the illness so yes I, I move away from the why me to actually this is life and everything is possible and if it's happened what's next absolutely absolutely agree with you what, what would you say to patients who are so emotionally low that they feel there is no hope at all? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if, the, if I've made this into a tricky question um, in, in the thoughts that are kind of popping up in, in my head. Um, the first thing is that I would check how emotionally low this person is. So what does that mean for the person? Um, emotionally low means lots of different things lots of different people so the first thing i would check and then i would also check to see if i'm the right person at that moment to be the only person supporting them so there may be a need for a doctor there may be need for a psychiatrist there may be need for a medication not that i promote any of those things but but this is all part of medical right, medical things i know some people are against medications but this is not my field and i have to make sure i, I put the people in the, in the right direction so the first thing is how emotionally low so i have to find out those details um, and the second thing that I would uh, work on is finding reasons of hope, first of all, from in that person's day. So what has gone on in their day that might have been good, that might have been positive. So not the whole day would have been bad. There would have been something that has given them that little bit of hope. And then I would look to create hope for the future. And that again is, is, is creating plans and individualized plans and looking at goals and looking at needs and finding a step-by-step -step approach, approach of success to get there. So yeah, I, I, I would say finding hope within that moment and then also finding some hope for uh, future things that are gonna go on in a person's life. Okay. So obviously when it comes to chronic illness, many people are forced to give up their job some people, you know, never get back to paid employment. I can put my hand up there. I didn't. Um, so, so we know there are plenty of people, quite a few listening here probably, who won't be able to afford counselling or psychotherapy or, you know, anything that we've talked about as a, you know, with, with a psychologist or a counsellor. Are there any good books, apps, or podcasts that you would recommend that they could access? Okay, so I'm sorry to be a little bit maybe difficult on my answer here. Um, mm. I, I don't actually recommend any of those things for anybody with a chronic illness or, or mental health. I do recommend uh, other colleagues for other things that are not within my area or my field that I absolutely do. Um, but I don't recommend things like books or apps or, or podcasts. Um, and the, the reason being is the work that I do uh, with a person is very individualized. It's very specific. And I, I, I get to know them almost backwards that, that I know what to build for them. If I recommend a book or an app or, or a podcast, they're very generalized. Now, I'm not saying they don't work. That's not my, not my space to say I have listened to them. It's not my space to say whether they work or not. But... For me, just to tell a person, listen to that, that's going to help you. Well, I can't. I can't say that. I can't even say whether there'll be an effect on them that, that's a loss to them or could be damaging to them. I don't know if something they heard may be a trigger for them. So I'm very careful not to actually make any recommendations. Um, and that's really why I try to establish myself on making individualised plans. I hope that helps. Yeah, that sounds fair. Um, so in the same vein... Um, 
how about any self-help tips for managing for managing low mood depression anxiety despair I think you, I think panic attacks is another one I think you touched on some of that along the way with you know the night time winding down getting a good environment but in general are there things that we can do to help ourselves with low Sorry. mood yeah well, well being right. careful what I just said kind of try not to yeah. you know give out uh, kind of thoughts on that might not apply or, or might be in essence harmful to some people um you know th th there are you know people do do meditation uh, they do do yoga um they might choose to read a a book which is not necessarily psychological um they will i would i would like people to uh educate themselves and read things and understand why things are happening and the reasons and how the brain and body works so i would suggest some of those things um i would also suggest uh, speaking to a friend or family member if they have that um, available to them um, and if they really feel that things aren't improving then of course try to seek uh, professional help okay we've gone through most of the questions that we had submitted so we'll just pick a couple from the chat box at the bottom because we've got a few minutes left what's time okay we've got about six or seven minutes left so some of the ones that have been um popped in um, one of the questions that actually came by email this evening was a bit more detailed when we talked about you know people not being able to get off to sleep so are there any ways of regaining the sleep rhythm obviously when the brain is very heightened by either the infection itself or or you know anxiety per se is there any way to you know get your sleep rhythm back is there anything we can do to help ourselves rather than, you know, going down the um, medication route, things like that? So there are relaxation techniques. There are, like I said, ways to uh, set up your room. There are uh, yoga and meditation. Um, and there are, of course, not drinking, like I said earlier, no caffeine and no exercise. Um, and then, of course, again, not my area and not my field, so I'm not going to say anything else, but there are supplements and there are vitamins and uh, that, that, that do help with things like that. And, of course, you know, you know you'll know know people. Um, other than that, I would like people to be quite strict, not to the point where they call themselves more anxiety, but with bedtime, um, to, to make bedtime fairly on time, and fairly scheduled, but again, not with, with causing um, any anxiety. Uh, and the same, same with waking up uh, in the morning. Um, and I would also say, depending on the chronic illness, trying not to nap during the day, but again, very individualized. So please take that as a very, you know, not as a serious comment there in that I don't know the people that are listening for, them, for me to say, don't take a nap. Um, but depending on the person I'm speaking to, that might be something I would recommend. OK, I'll just have a quick look on the chat box. Just to sort of finish off with the last question. Um, somebody was asking, I think this probably steps outside what you want to talk about, but somebody was asking is, um, where is it going? Are you are you aware of any relationship a relationship between Lyme disease and psychosis? I think that's probably stepping outside what you stepping do. Stepping slightly outside of what I would like to make any comments or answer. Sorry. Yeah, I thought so. Um, and I think the last one probably. Um, so somebody's asked, how can we learn? I think you've probably touched on this really when we talked about family and friends. How can we learn to let go the fear of sharing new symptoms, experiences with loved ones and become more open? Because people, you know, if they've encountered very dismissive attitudes from doctors and stuff, they tend to hold back, you know, if something occurs and they're like, nobody wants to hear this. Is it how can we overcome that, do you think? Um well, I would say don't do anything that is harmful to you physically or psychologically or, em or emotionally. 
And if you're holding back these things and you're not saying how you're feeling and you're not saying what's hurting and you're not saying what your emotions are, actually you, you in essence hurt yourself. I would say, just say it, say everything that's going on. But again, with the expectation, you understand not everyone is going to believe you. You understand some people are not interested, but I would still say, I would still say how you're feeling. You are an individual, you are a human, you are entitled to say how you're doing. I would say, just go for it. I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely, because um, it's so harmful, isn't it? When you just hold, the more you hold back, the, the worse the, the cycle gets, I, I personally think. And um, if somebody really cares about you, they'll listen. That's my feelings. Um, anyway, I think we've gone through all the questions and we're at a couple of minutes to eight o'clock. So I, I, like to wind up this session by saying a massive thank you to you. Thank you. Um, I don't know about people listening, but I can literally relate to just about everything you say. So I'm sure plenty of other people are sitting there in their houses going. <laughs> <laughs> so the charity would like to say a massive thank you for giving up your time for us. Thank you to you for There's asking a me to speak. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. There's a few thank yous popping up in the chat box if you can see them on your phone. I can, yeah. And uh, literally, um, um, everybody will either get this recording or we'll do an overview for people. And um, thank you to all the people attending. We've had great attendance at all these seminars. And I say we've had a break over Chris uh, Christmas. I'm, I'm ahead of myself now, Christmas, uh, over the summer period. Uh, so it's nice to be back. And lovely that so many people are registering. Thank you ever so much, Daniel. I'll be in touch. Thank and, you. Um, you are. You're welcome. And I'll just end this meeting for everybody and say good night to everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.